I don't hear anything. Is it me? I, oh. I was muted. It was me. It was me. I was saying, I'm going to take every minute I can get with you. Um, how are you doing? And now that gives me a little bit of time where I can be like, hey, how's it going? What's up? Nice to see you. Hey, what's up? What's up? I've been good. I um, am happy I don't have the vid because everyone in New York has had it. <laughs> yeah. I went to Miami and somehow got out of Miami without it. Oh, so you're a Teflon then essentially. Yeah. I don't know how you did I, that. <laughs> I don't know. It's that superhero life, I guess, but there's no... <laughs> There was absolutely no reason I should have left Miami without COVID because <laughs> we weren't irresponsible or anything, but like we were amidst the people. We did eat at many a restaurant and do many a thing that like, granted, there was a lot of outdoor, but still I kind of felt like I was yeah. like dodging Ronas. <laughs> I love that you were like, we were amongst the people. It was we almost were amongst like the people. into like a zombie land. You're like, <laughs> you survived the invasion. It did feel a little bit like that season one Walking Dead where you like cover yourself with all the goo and just walk through <laughs> real slowly. It's kind of what it felt like. Um, well, I'm glad that you did not get the vid uh, and you stay yeah. safe, please. I stayed safe. I got to go to Utah for the holidays. First time in like four years, which was nice. What is Utah's yeah. culture around the vid like? Is everybody real chill? I got a buddy who goes to Nebraska for his family and he's like, it's a different world. It is a parallel universe, it feels like. It's just like, COVID's not a big deal. No one wears masks. There were an abundance of at-home tests, which I definitely scooped up. I was like, oh, y'all don't want them? I'm taking them because in New York, they were hard yeah. to find. They were selling Oh, out. yeah. So I'm at Walgreens, like, hoarding tests. And people are like, what the hell's wrong with this woman? I'm like, yeah, it's like, a, it's like the, the golden ticket, the Willy Wonka. You're like, ooh, I found yeah, a good Yeah, people like that. But yeah, no one wore masks, except for a couple of stores, like Walgreens, because probably because they have, you know, stores everywhere. Yeah. Everybody had masks on there. But everywhere else I went, I'd be, like, the one person with a mask on and everyone was like, okay. Yeah. I mean, honestly, in Miami, I felt a little bit out of place and which is weird because I don't know. I feel like cities, I'm always like surprised if any city is like, not like New York or Philly. <laughs> like, it's right. always just weird yeah. to me, but, um, I don't know, is what it is. Glad that we are all, uh, safe and sound at Were the moment. The and holidays? Video so was it like a vacation thing or was it how you spent the holidays? Kind of. So it was work yeah. trip. Uh, end of the year, but I did bring my wife with me so that she could sit by the pool and be out in the sun and she didn't have to watch over baby. And it was real cool. And, uh, you know, she enjoyed most of the time. I mostly worked and then had like new year's Eve. Okay. <laughs> that sounds fun though. That's it's like still warm. Idea. So yeah. I was cool with it. You know, it was fine. Yeah. It was I think it was the perfect time to go. Cause the hurricanes are kind of died down. Like you can get good weather. Yeah. It's the perfect time to go. Yeah. It's good times. Um, all right. You want to talk about uh, communication guidelines and, and cool stuff? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do the thing. Let's start by like, okay, so I, I don't know if you were listening in or not, but I did preface with saying that everybody should go and read everything you do and attend your workshops, and do all your cool stuff. Oh, um, right. So I'm a big fan, as you know, um, which is, you know, it, it, I, I think this is like, uh, you know, a friendship, not a parasocial relationship, but like, yeah, for I, sure. you know, I mean, I, I do, I do kind of crush on your work. So <laughs> tell people about your work. What do you do? What, what is, because, you know, you have a different way of presenting the type of work you do than I think a lot of people are used to, uh, yeah. even though a lot of the outcomes or what you're after may sound similar to people. So talk about it. Yeah. So are, are we live? Yeah, we're live. Oh, we're I didn't realize we're live. Wow. Okay. Yeah, no, we're so, already live. We're already in this. I thought we were just vibing. Oh, so. I mean, we, we do that too. <laughs> While live though. The new quote essentially is a company that I started out of a couple of different pain points, which was working in marketing, media and sales for a long time and using story to get people to do things and to buy stuff that I didn't think was actually that useful or that impactful. But I saw the story had this incredible effect on how people think, what they do, what they say, what they believe, what they buy. And so I started to look into the research behind it. And then I was in a nonprofit role where I was using storytelling to get people to volunteer and to do positive social things on discrimination, women's health, you name it. But I'm like, why is no one applying the tool of narrative on these really challenging social issues, communication issues, really personal development issues? I just felt like no one was really doing it. So I started to dig into the research and I was like, oh, there's something here around the psychological impact of story when it comes to our biases and our beliefs, and especially about power and how we relate to each other when it comes to power. And from there, I built these frameworks around leadership in the workplace and how to use narrative to not only uncover your own beliefs and biases that could be in the way of your relationship building and your communication, but also in a way to better understand the world around you, to better understand people who are different from yourself so that you can reach your fullest potential as a leader. 
And that's essentially manifested in courses, consulting, strategic conversation facilitation. Um, I've trained at this stage around 8,000 leaders across nine industries. And what I essentially teach them is this idea of narrative intelligence, how you can use narrative to improve yourself, to improve your communication, your decision making, your goal setting, improve your relationships and make them more equitable and inclusive. That's really the goal. I love it so much. And I love when you send me an email that's like, I think you do it bi-yearly or yearly, where you send me like the updates of the impact. And it's like, it's just really exciting to see someone out there trying to make a difference in the world. And then you come back and you're like, here are tangible numbers of like lives touched, people people impacted. I absolutely love it. So I want to I want to dig into the communication side of things. So, you know, uh, I, I mentioned to you that today is about the eight commitments of the team. One of the commitments that I uh, think is vital for a team that's going to create a safe work environment, high trust amongst people, high care amongst people, and the ability to go together towards a destination and get there safely is communication guidelines, is understanding how we're going to communicate with one another. What are the what are the out of bounds? How are we going to deal when we go out of bounds? All of that sort of stuff, I think, is really, really super uh, important and impactful. That is, in many ways, as you just described, a, it, probably a subsection of your work applies to how do we talk to one another um, in, in the workplace? So the book is written for new managers. So walk us through what you think are some of the critical things to think about, about uh, setting the guidelines for the team so that you can have an effective, high trust, high performance team. I love this because it's like any relationship, like you would never enter a relationship where you shouldn't, I would hope you wouldn't, where there's just a ton of assumptions and no actual clear expectations on boundaries, mm -hmm. love languages, lifestyles. You know, I think it's the same thing with teams of understanding each other and your needs and also your shared goals. And I would say there's four key things every team needs to have in their guidelines, which is a commitment to improving their cultural competency, which is your understanding of different cultures and the history of those cultures, because that affects everything. It affects the things we make. It affects the impacts that your products and services may have in the environment. It will affect the kind of language and visuals that you use. And I would say most people's cultural competency is fairly low because we don't have that as an emphasis in our formal education system. So I'll give you a great example of that. Growing up in Utah, I had to go out of my way to learn about Black invention and leaders and creators. That was not part of my curriculum. Now, not to say that's every single school, but that's probably more of the norm than not, especially in United States education. education. So I had to go out of my way to read about that stuff and to teach myself to fill in the gaps and the holes of what I call historical amnesia so I could have a more full, informed perspective of the world and the people who live in this world outside of certain groups. So I would say a commitment to that regularly, whether it's trainings, um, regular book readings, and having it relate to your industry. Every single industry has a rich, complex cultural history outside of the dominant norms that we know. So that is a, a commitment I think guidelines should have. Um, the second is uh, really making sure that the team is encouraged to ask questions of curiosity and to not make assumptions. There's a lot, many times where people will make an assumption about why someone's doing something, why they may be failing a deadline, why a thing might not be happening, but instead of directly asking in an open way that's not accusatory or full of content and criticism, there's a big assumption potentially made, and then there's triangulation and passive aggressive communication. And that is destructive and it's toxic. And I would say most workplaces have that. So asking questions of curiosity and being open and saying, hey, I've noticed that there's been a few deadlines that have been missed. I would love to understand what's going on and figure out how we can fix this versus saying, oh, you know, Cheryl missed two deadlines. She's a lazy, you know, whatever. I'm going to her boss to complain and throw her under the bus. So asking questions is important and to not make assumptions. Can and I pause you on that one and yeah. ask a follow up to that? Because it, it's a really interesting point, uh, asking questions of curiosity. Um, what immediately strikes me is that you there's some sort of preconditions that kind of have to be there for that to even happen. Right, because the same question can be received by two different people in two different ways based upon the relationship that already exists there. Right. Yeah. So if you already have an existing safe and trusted relationship, you can actually even ask things on a bad day and ask it with a tone. And somebody's gonna give you that grace to say, Oh, I know this person, I know their intention, I know where they're coming from, I know what they're, you know, we're good. As opposed to if there's not that basis of trust there, it's gonna be difficult to actually have that land with the intent of not being judgmental, of not being um, you know, accusatory in any way, but rather validating and being in it from a place of curiosity. How do you go about recommending a leader start that so that those questions of curiosity come across the right way? 
I love that question because I think questions of curiosity can actually get you to a place of trust as well. So in my mind, it's the types of questions that you ask people that creates vulnerability and trust because you're showing interest in another person's world and experience. And so one of the things I encourage my teams that I train is to learn how to ask people things about themselves that don't assume things. So for example, say somebody loves to wear cowboy boots and they come into your office and they're wearing them every day and they look super fly and you're just curious about it. Asking the question, why do you wear cowboy boots? Feels judgmental. It feels potentially not curious and that can shut the conversation down. Um, instead of asking the question, what inspires you to wear cowboy boots? I think it's really cool, right? Yeah. That's the same kind of question, but it's positioned differently. And asking a what versus why question, ironically, is much more open. Usually why feels like you have to prove why that thing is happening or why it matters. What can be more open-ended? So I think learning how to ask better questions of people so you can learn about them and show interest in their inner worlds and lives establishes trust and safety. And I think if people get good at asking the right kinds of questions, then they can also get deeper and maybe ask a little bit more personal questions or more direct or uncomfortable questions if there is a conflict on a team. And people need to get better at that because right now I think most teams op operate on a very surface level. And it's fine. You don't have to be besties with your colleagues. It's That's not always how, how it's going to happen. But if you know absolutely nothing about them in any kind of shape or form besides what they do for you and their deadlines, you're going to struggle with establishing trust at all. So I think Questions of curiosity is the process and the habit of asking informed, open-ended, not judgmental questions that allows the person to showcase who they are, to be open about themselves, their values, their lives, what they've experienced in a way that can build trust. And that could be used before an issue in a relationship, and it can be used as a tool when a relationship or an issue arises so that you can have a better conversation. Would you advise, because you gave a really good example there, and I'm just wondering, tactically for those that are brand new at this, so kind of like paint by number on this, mm -hmm. would you advise that it makes sense when asking a question? The cowboy boots is such a good example because, you know, being from New York and now in Philly, like I see somebody in cowboy boots, I'm like, huh? Um, but I, I, I guess... What, what occurred to me is saying, starting out with something like, I've noticed you wear cowboy boots a lot and you're really pulling them off. Um, really, it's your style. Where did, where did that start for you? Like kind of giving the, the, the kudos to it or like paying the compliment as part of it. Do you think that tactically that's a way of kind of opening the door to kind of counteract any potential judgment? Yeah, I think that's a great way of positioning it. And the question that I pose as an example has that at the end. So using the, and it's also thinking about the types of action words. So mm -hmm. if you use the word inspired, inspired can mean you're doing something creative and interesting. So mm -hmm. i say, what inspired you to do blank? It allows them to say, oh, here's the genesis of why I've made these choices, which sounds aspirational and positive, versus being like, why do you wear cowboy boots? Even if you were like, yeah. why do you wear cowboy boots? It still feels like I got to prove my love of cowboy boots in this office. I yeah. can't live life. La, you know, that's the whole response people will usually have. But I love that paint by numbers question because I typically will emphasize um, thinking through language. Language is incredibly powerful and important. And we adopt a lot of habits around language and we just repeat them and don't know any better. Mm -hmm. And I would say with questions, there's sort of two camps. There are people who don't ask any questions at all and show little to no curiosity. And I think that that's bad. It's not necessarily because they don't care. It's because they don't want to be intrusive or don't want to be nosy. But that can also come off as indifferent. It can also come off as apathetic. And that can be bad in terms of building relationships. There's the other camp, super duper nosy, and they just want to know information to potentially use that as a, a strategy and a structure of power. And their questions will be the accusatory, judgmental, why do you do this? Why do you do that? Or and there usually is a lot of why questions, ironically. So not to say you can never use the word why, but I think it's important to understand context and the power of language in these conversations and to know that you don't have to dive into the deep end with question asking to start to establish basic um, understanding and trust. So a great example of this, when I was running a team in a media company, the team was it kind of scattered across the country in LA, Chicago, and New York. So we were doing a lot of remote work. And the ways that we stayed connected, we would have these morning meetings where we would gather every single morning and talk about the projects that we had and the deadlines we had. And we would ask ridiculous and funny questions about just things happening in our lives, creative projects that we're working on. We had a random debate about lotion one day and like who lotions and who doesn't, which was hilarious. It was very cultural. I'm like, you don't lotion? Wow, that's so, that's so insightful. Why is that? Um, but the, it kind of started off from small little questions that ended up building enough trust that we can have kind of these fun, more open, dynamic discussions. And we were having them every day, even though we weren't physically close, 
we were having enough of a conversation where people felt that level of trust, even if we were physically seeing each other every single day. So I think it is a process that you as a leader can establish on your team at ritual points of uh, connection and meetings and that sort of thing. Well, I appreciate you indulging the paint by numbers thing. It's something that, you know, when my wife and I talk about management and leadership, she often asks for scripts and like, that's one of the ways that she learns. And I've noticed that, um, especially as it relates to, you know, you mentioned the importance of words and in, in communication. I think a lot of people have trouble coming up with the exact right words to frame a particular question. And I think offering that paint by numbers is really helpful. Um, I have seven minutes and 30 seconds left with you. So I want to make sure that I get through your communication guidelines that you had queued up because I think you gave me two of them so far. Oh, yes. Yeah. So to the cultural comment, we ask, we, uh, ask questions of curiosity. And the other is uh, improving their narrative intelligence. So it's the understanding of how story affects your brain and how story affects other people. And there's a lot of ways you can do that. I have a white paper on narrative intelligence that I always recommend people read. I also think it's important to learn just storytelling skills. That includes metaphor, story structure, what happens if you use humor, what happens if you use um, fear in story. There's all these really basic practical tools of story and how it affects how people think. And if you want to be an effective leader in any kind of way, you are constantly telling stories, typically around the goals and why we're setting them. Um, also on what the team is trying to do and achieve and what the organization is ultimately trying to achieve. And the better of a storyteller you are, the more likely you'll get buy-in and influencer on your ideas. And so improving those skills, even if it's an inbuilt skill that we're all using all the time, it can only make you a more effective communicator. And that includes reading tons of stories that you're not familiar with from artists and creatives that you typically wouldn't follow because you'll always learn something new, whether it's really interesting anecdotes and examples that you can reference or different ways of thinking about a story arc from inciting event to conflict and challenge to resolution. That's kind of like the standard story structure, but there's other types. Um, that all in itself, whether you work in marketing and sales or not, because a lot of people in marketing and sales do that kind of stuff, it's important for your own ability to be influential and to be impactful in how you're managing your team and how you're interacting with your teammates. I, and I, ever since you, you were my introduction to this idea of narrative intelligence. And ever since you brought it up, I've been looking for it everywhere. And, um, and I, I think I recently sent you an example that I saw in a book that I thought was really impactful because, um, when you tell someone a story from your own life as part of a team, let's say I tell you a story about my life. If I tell you facts and figures about something that I believe you could counter it with your facts and figures. But if I tell you a story about something that I've been through, you can't invalidate my experience that I had as I'm telling it. I'm telling you my story. So there's, yep. you can't say you didn't actually see that and you didn't actually think it was beautiful. Like, no, I'm telling you that I did. Whereas if I tell you, you know, facts and figures about a particular thing, you could always counter it with your own facts and figures. And, and I, as I look for those sorts of examples, when I see it happen or when um, I see examples of it, I'm so moved by how powerful that actually is that the stories and hearing somebody else's experience really does allow us that instantaneous sort of empathetic journey. Even if we don't have that muscle really well developed, you still have to, to a certain extent, to even follow the story, kind of identify with the person in the story and see yeah. through their eyes for a second. And that little bit of movement in what you may be holding firm to, I think is so powerful. Uh, and as a leader, if you can leverage that on your team where people can use stories to build that connection, I, you know, ever since you brought it up, I've been really fascinated by it. I love that. And you did send, did I respond to that? Cause I feel like I read it and I was going to respond. I don't know. It. I've been planning this event for the last month. And like, that's been like the, it's been every, every minute that I'm not working with clients. I need to read it, but you bring, you bring up two great points. And I want to quickly highlight the science of why that's happening. So the idea of neural coupling was uh, discovered by MC Brock and TC Green. They're two scientists. So they wanted to understand what happens in your brain when you hear a story. And they discovered that there's mirror neurons that are created. So when I'm telling a story, your brain is firing in the same sort of sensory sections of the brain. So you can feel certain things that I'm saying. You could potentially see certain things I'm saying, maybe even um, imaginarily smell certain things I'm describing. And that is just how humans connect with each other and organize information in narrative format. That's how we remember it. That's how it occurs. And then the other thing is narrative transport, which is why you physically feel like you're transported when you watch a movie or you're in a play. You feel like you're in the story, that like you're in the experience they're creating. And it's fascinating because our brains did that purposely. It's a easier way to parse information and to make quick decisions. The downside of that is if you have false stories or stories that are based out of uh, pretty negative and destructive things that can also lead us 
down a different path. A great example of that is Birth of a Nation, the film that came out. It was probably the first feature film in the United States. And essentially it was focused on this idea of these uh, black males who were quote unquote attacking white women in, the, in this town. And it was a fictional story and it was sort of this hypersexual fear-based narrative around like black un 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 unadulterated desire. And the movie essentially stirred up a lot of anxiety and there was a huge uptick in people you know, enrolling in hate crimes and hate groups like exponentially after the film was released. So there is direct results from certain narratives being adjusted on how people think and the policies they make and the things that they do. And that's why I think it's incredibly important to understand how much narrative does impact the physical world and our environments and also our behaviors with each other. And that's what I like to teach because people are like, oh, whatever, it's fictional, it doesn't matter, it's entertainment. It absolutely matters. And if you can understand that as a tool of power, and use it for good, then you're going to be a leader who's going to stand out from other leaders. Yes, and if you if you ask people what are the stories that resonate with them, I think that reveals so much about them. You ask them like, what are the stories that, who are the fictional characters you admire? What are the stories that really resonate and, and move you? It tells you so much about a person because those are the stories that they're going to in some way identify and embody and try to emulate the things that move them. So I 100%, uh, I'm locked in on your your narrative intelligence as, as a, an amazing tool. Uh, what's the what's the fourth one? Because I only have a few minutes left with you and I still want to ask you the, the final question. So the fourth one was just compassionate but direct communication, which we already kind of got to. But yeah. that's the idea of being able to be direct without being um, attacking. And there's a concept called nonviolent communication, which is just the idea of being able to have conflict without it being destructive. So... You're able to directly, and usually the, the paint by numbers way of doing that is to talk about the event that's occurred, the effect of the event, and the hopeful solution. So I can give an example of that, right, where I've had somebody in the past who is consistently missing deadlines and sort of leaving work without really telling people what the, the ETA was on certain projects. So I had to sit them down and say, hey, I've noticed that the last three projects we've missed the deadline. And what's, what's happening is there's a lack of trust and understanding when you might follow through on a project and also we're missing deadlines for our clients. So I would love to understand how we can restructure your schedule so that you can have a better um, just wiggle room to essentially achieve this potential project. Instead of saying, hey, you're lazy and non-committed to your job, right? Those are two different ways to do it. Accusatory accusations, character assassination, labeling people, that's destructive and violent communication. And that's typically how people learn how to address conflict. It's either through being super abrasive, extremely aggressive, very judgmental, and also jumping to assumptions. The other side of it is just stating the facts. And you can still say this affected me negatively. Here's the emotional or physical impact of this thing that happened, but you're not labeling them. I could say you missed this deadline and it means that this happened or this bad thing occurred, but I'm, I'm not saying you're lazy. Yeah. So I think that's the difference is teaching people how to use direct and nonviolent communication to get things done and not being conflict avoidant because conflict avoidance is really bad in a team. And I think it's why we have such destructive workplaces to begin with. People are extremely passive aggressive or they're avoiding conflict to the point of no return where they can't have a productive conversation about anything. So I would say that'd be that fourth guideline is how do we learn how to address conflict in a way that's not super destructive and in your face to the point of no trust or doing nothing at all. And there's then no trust then as well, sort of this balancing act. Yeah. I just, um, I'm almost done with, um, Leanne Davies book, the good fight. She was just on yesterday to talk about productive conflict mm -hmm. and she has like, you know, a hundred examples in there of different conversations and how to start them and how to have them. And in ways that are kind of, as you mentioned, nonviolent, um, compassionate and direct. Um, so I would recommend that book to, to anybody. If you haven't read it, check it out. It's pretty good. Um, I love the title. Yeah, I would love yeah. To book out. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, really great book. Um, but yeah, I, I completely appreciate that. And I, and I, I, I think in, in, uh, I just read at the beginning, right before you came on, uh, direct, concise, kind, uh, respectful, like uh, these are different things I think help to make for productive, uh, conversations, uh, inside of a team. So I only have a, uh, about a minute left with you. So I want to ask you the, the final question I've been asking all my guests, uh, when I came up with the book, the lovable leader the title just rang for me and I hope it rings for others. So when I say lovable leader, who from your past or present uh, comes to mind? As I was thinking about this, I was really thinking through who is somebody whose work has really affected how I think and how I do leadership. And of 
course, the first person I thought of was Brene Brown, which everyone talks about her work constantly. But what I really like about her work is the idea of understanding shame and its a relationship to power and how many times we're trying to have power and control to reduce our senses of shame. And so it was just a very unique way of looking at leadership and also walking the talk through how she's built her organizations, how she openly talks about conflict and the issues she's had as a leader herself on her teams. I think she walks the talk and she backs up what she does with a really interesting vulnerability and understanding of systems that I think few people are really you know, doing. A lot of people are emulating what she's doing, but it came from a place of curiosity and research and really wanting to understand the issue and then being like, hey, y'all, have you thought about these ideas? They're not really crazy or radical, but we're not really talking about it openly. So I think that's a lovable leader is somebody who's willing to go against the status quo in ways that are productive and full of solutions and also help people to see new normals and to be excited about them. I love it. That's a great answer. And you know, I'm a big fan of Brene. She's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, thank you for coming on. Thank you for supporting my book launch. And um, thank you for all the work that you're doing out there. You continue to help me learn and grow as a leader and as a person. And, uh, you know, I'm cheering you on as well. So um, thank you so much for coming and supporting me. Well, thank you for having me and for the great questions and for the, the cheerleadership of my work as well. I so appreciate it. And I think the book you made is smart impactful and something that everybody should read, especially as they're building a team, because a lot of us aren't taught leadership. We just emulate what we know. And it's great to be able to have a guide that's like, let's, how do we do this the right way? Cool. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. That endorsement uh, means a lot to me. I'll talk to you soon, right? All right. All right. See you.